I've been married to Stephanie for almost 20 years now, and if I had to put my life on the line, I'd bet she was so in tune with me that she could pick me out of a crowd of men, even if she was blindfolded. We had something of a psychic ability when it came to each other. Each of us always knew what the other was thinking, and we always seemed to be able to sense when the other was around. I am a traveling salesman and am usually on the road two weeks out of every three. Steph has been the executive secretary of a manufacturing firm since our two children were old enough to start school. Because of my profession and the many separations it caused, Steph and I had a fantastic personal life. She was always so happy to see me come home, and I was always so happy to be around her that we never reached the point in our marriage where sex became ho-ho-ho. It didn't bother anyone that Steph loved sex and always wanted to experiment and try new things. She would pick up an issue of Cosmopolitan and read an article about ten ways to pleasure her man, and if any of those ways included sex, she just had to try it. She got her hands on a copy of the Kama Sutra a couple years ago, and we are still trying out different positions. She said we'd all still be fucking when we reached 80. Then a series of events occurred that would undoubtedly change my marriage and my life. I was on the fourth day of a seven-day trip to the Northeast when I got a call from my boss telling me I needed to rush home. Our home office had just announced that they had acquired our largest competitor and that I needed to be present for the reallocation of sales territories. This meant I would be home for the Steph Company Christmas party that I would have otherwise missed. I almost grabbed the phone to tell her the good news, but at the last second I decided to just surprise her. Just five hours before my boss's phone call, I had been working with a customer demonstrating a new line of adhesives. One of the tubes burst under pressure, and some of the glue got on my hair and beard. No amount of solvent, paint thinner, mecca, or acetone could wash it off, so I did the only thing I could do. I shaved my beard and cut my hair short. When the call from my boss rang and I realized I could make it to Steph's party, I decided to play a little prank on her. Steph had never seen me without a beard, and she had never seen me with hair that wasn't long 70s hippie style, although I had shortened it a bit as I got older. I had a beard when I met her and I'd never shaved it off. I decided to make a few more changes, show up at her party, wait until I could catch her under the mistletoe, and then kiss her passionately. She wouldn't know who I was until our lips met, and no one else there would know it was me either. I smiled, thinking of the rumors that would creep in when her co-workers saw her infatuated with a strange man. I went to the men's store and bought a new suit and tie so I could be dressed in clothes Steph had never seen before. I stopped by the drugstore and bought a pair of weak reading glasses, and then packed up my things and headed to the airport. When my flight landed, I went to the office and spent the day working with Harry on a reorganization plan. At half past six, I headed home, confident that Steph would follow her usual habit of bringing a change of clothes to work and that she would go to the party from work. She would also get a hotel room for the night so she wouldn't drive home intoxicated. I took precautions and called home when I was two blocks away, but there was no answer. Just in case, I drove by the house looking for signs of life and parked further down the street. I went back to the house and looked in the window on the side of the garage, but her car wasn't there, so I went back and got my car and pulled into the driveway. I showered, shaved, and put on my new clothes and my weak glass glasses, and as I looked at myself in the mirror, I wondered how long it would take Steph to recognize me. Given what we had with psychics, I half expected her to know about me as soon as I walked through the door. I hoped she wouldn't. I wanted to get her under the mistletoe before she guessed. The party was being held in one of the hotel's banquet rooms, and when I arrived, the buffet-style dinner was ready. I spotted Steph at a table near the area that would be used as the dance floor later in the evening. She was sitting with three other girls, and although it was probably just my imagination, I thought I saw her look up for a second when I walked in. Had she really sensed my presence? At this distance? She looked around quickly, but then went back to talking to her friends. I noticed an empty table in the far corner, so I grabbed a drink from the open bar, walked over to the table, and sat down. It would be at least an hour before the dancing started and I could have my little surprise. I was watching Steph and sipping a vodka tonic when the first challenge of the evening happened. Two guys were heading towards my table. I looked around and saw that the empty chairs at my table were the only empty chairs in the room. I knew both men. I'd met them at previous picnics and company parties but would they recognize me? 
Mind if we join you? You seem to have the only seats in the hall. I waved my hand toward the available seats, and they sat down and introduced themselves. I lowered my voice to disguise it a bit and told them my real name. Tom asked me what company I worked for, but before I could lie, I was in for my first surprise of the evening. Steph got up to go to the ladies' room and my jaw dropped. Her blouse was cut so low that her tits were almost completely exposed. She was wearing the shortest skirt I'd ever seen, and she was wearing shoes with 12-centimeter heels. She looked like a street prostitute looking for work. Larry saw where I was looking. She's something, isn't she? Tom interjected. It looks like someone might get lucky tonight. What does that mean? I asked. Her husband is out of town on business. And sometimes when he's not around, she entertains herself. Judging by the way she's dressed tonight, this just might be one of those times. What do you mean? She's out partying. That's the thing about Steffi, you never know with her. She likes to be inventive, and she rarely does the same thing twice. Suddenly, I wasn't interested in surprising my wife. It seemed like she was the one who was going to do the surprises. This year, they were using a DJ and records instead of a live band, and I watched almost every guy there dance with Steph at least once. About an hour into the dance, I saw a guy hand something to Steph, and then I watched as she secured it in her hair. It was a big sprig of mistletoe. He led her out onto the dance floor, and then they kissed. It wasn't just a light kiss on the cheek. It was a long, hot, passionate kiss, and I saw the guy's hands slide down to Steph's ass and pull her to him. Then the guys started to get involved, and the kisses stayed hot and passionate, and there wasn't a part of Steph's body that wasn't being groped, and Steph did nothing, not a single thing, to fight them off. Tom and Larry both got up to dance with her. Tom was dancing with her when the DJ announced a short break. Tom headed back to our table with Steph in tow. I braced myself for a confrontation, but when we were introduced, all she did was look at me strangely and ask, Have we met? In my changed voice, I said we hadn't. Weird. I have a strong feeling that I know you. I just shrugged, got up and went to pour myself another drink. When I got back to the table, Steph and Tom were kissing and Larry had his hand up her skirt. Tom and Steph broke the kiss when I sat down and Steph turned to me and asked, Are you sure we've never met? Positive. Just then, the DJ played the music again, and Steph looked at me and asked, Are you going to ask me to dance? Sorry, I don't dance. Sore knees. That's a shame, she said, and leaned over to me. I wouldn't want you to be the only one here who hasn't kissed me under the mistletoe. She kissed me, and her tongue penetrated my mouth. I waited a second, then returned the favor. Now she'll understand, I thought. But when she pulled away, all she did was look at me strangely, and then Larry pulled her back onto the dance floor. For the next hour, I watched Steph do almost everything on the dance floor except actual intercourse. She glanced at me every now and then, and I expected a light bulb to go off over her head at any minute. As the party began to wind down, Steph left the dance floor and came over to my table. We're going to move the party upstairs to room 921. You're invited. Knock three times and she left. I was torn between going up to the room or going home and waiting for her, but curiosity eventually won out, and after a few cups of coffee in the hotel's 24-hour coffee shop, I headed to room 921. I knocked three times and the door was opened by Larry. Come on in and check out the room. The door closed behind me, and all my attention was on what was happening on the bed. Steph was riding on top of a guy. There were five other men standing around, waiting for either their turn or seconds. Tom walked over to me. I told you she was something special, didn't I? If I had been her husband, there was no way in the world I would have walked away and left her alone. I just stood there and watched. Things started to slow down as the guys got dressed and started to leave. Steph looked at me and noticed that I was still standing fully clothed. She frowned and then made an inviting gesture with her hand. Come here. Come here, mystery man. I know I know you from somewhere, and I think I'd like to get to know you a little better. She rolled over onto her back, spread her legs and arms, and said, Come on, honey. I just stood there looking down at her for a few seconds, and then I shook my head negatively and said in my usual voice, No thanks, Fluff, my nickname for her. I don't think so. 
I saw her recognize me, and then there was a shocked expression on her face as I turned and left the room to go home and wait.